Hi there, it's Jeff here with another in our series of country profile videos. And this time we're going to think a little bit about the, the fascinating economy of Bangladesh. Bangladesh uh, was granted independence over 50 years ago. And in that period, it's achieved remarkable progress. Annual growth of around 6% per year since the 2000s in particular makes it one of the fastest growing countries in the world. And clearly growth of that size in excessive population growth has helped to lift per capita incomes. If we go back to the early 70s, Bangladesh was one of the poorest countries on the planet with a nominal per capita income of just $95, very high infant mortality rate and a life expectancy of just 46 and a half years. And we'll track some of their development progress uh, in a second or two. So it's one of the most populous countries in the world, uh, or one of the fastest growing nations in the global economy. And it's a good example to use if you're an A-level or an IB student of a country that is driven by export-led growth. So exports are a prime driver of demand and supply-side growth, particularly, as you will see, in textiles. Now, Bangladesh is on track to graduate from least developed country status uh, in the next year or so. They have an aspiration to reach upper middle income status by 2031 and high income status 10 years later. That will be a significant challenge, as we'll see. Sustainable growth is a major issue for Bangladesh. It's held back by big gaps in social economic development and also, critically, uh, by the challenges of tackling climate change. Again, as we'll see, Bangladesh is a country... Uh, one of the most uh, vulnerable countries in the world to the impact of climate change, in particular cyclones and flooding. But the growth rate for Bangladesh has been mightily impressive, as this chart shows. This chart tracks uh, growth since 2018, with forecasts uh, for the years ahead. Notice that even during the pandemic year of 2020, uh, the economy continued to grow. The, the growth rate slowed, it more than halved, but very few countries in the world managed to avoid a recession in 2020. And this just tracks a relative growth for Bangladesh, uh, for India and also for Sri Lanka. And it gives a picture of the difficulties the Sri Lankan economy has had uh, in recent times. But Bangladesh on a par with indeed exceeding Indian growth at the moment. It is a growth success story. And as a result, their share of world GDP this is uh, measured for uh, PPP, adjusted for purchasing power parity, data published each year by the IMF. So back in 2018, Bangladesh had 0.7% of global GDP. And uh, within the next few years, the forecast is that they will climb above 1%. They'll join that select group of nations, often populous countries with fast-growing economies, uh, where the, they account for more than 1% of the world economy. So I said I'd say something a bit about development progress. Well, per capita incomes, GDP per capita in 2022 was just over two and a half thousand dollars. If one makes a PPP adjustment, taking into account relative living costs, Bangladesh's GDP per head goes up to six point two or six point three thousand uh, dollars. They have a relatively low Gini coefficient, 0.32, suggesting that, uh, and that's low. Anything below a uh, four point four is 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 relatively low. Um, and suggesting that there was a, you know, obviously a mass of the population on relatively low incomes, but not huge inequalities, although that clearly exists. Look at some of the development progress there. Life expectancy was 66 at the turn of the millennium. It's now 72. So it's gone up by six years in 23 years. The poverty headcount ratio. Now, we here we're taking uh, people, percentage of the population living on less than $2.15 a day PPP. That's 5%. Uh, it was 33% in 2000. Uh, there's been an increase, uh, a threefold increase in percentage of people using safely managed sanitation systems, up from an 11% in 20, uh, 20, 2000 sorry, to 31%, the latest data. Now, clearly, that's still a low figure. Uh, Bangladesh has a lot to achieve in terms of urbanisation and uh, improving their uh, water and sewage infrastructure, but it's gone up to 31%. Likewise, big increase in percentage uh, of people of the relevant age group completing secondary education, up from 54% 24 years ago to 82% now. Now look, Bangladesh is still not in the top 100 countries in the world on human development. It's 129th last time around. And one of the problems that it does face is high levels of corruption. They are placed 149th 
on the Corruption Perception Index published by Transparency International. As I say, the demographics still favour Bangladesh in many ways. It's one of the most populous countries in the world. And uh, they have a young population. And again, the, the challenge for Bangladesh is can they uh, create enough jobs? Can they diversify their economy? Can they uh, grow businesses and industries to scale with the advantage of a young median age amongst the population and a youngish population? Although the share of people aged between 0 and 14 has fallen from 32% in 2012 to 27% now but there is you know, essentially Bangladesh has this demographic sweet spot although there is net net outward migration but it's got this demographic sweet spot in a similar way to India I talked about people leaving Bangladesh and uh, it is a country where remittances are significant 4.5% of GDP came in in the form of remittances in 2022 and that amounted to over 21% billion dollars so a good example again of a country for whom remittance inflows are a significant and and rising uh, contribution to uh, to gdp adding to their gni now this is quite interesting this just breaks down three main sectors showed their agriculture industry and services there's obviously quaternary as well but uh, looking at the breakdown of gdp by sector you can see that farming has moved from 17% of GDP in 2012 to about 11% now. So there has been that structural transformation. So keep in mind that farming accounts for about 11-12% of GDP. We'll come back to that in a second. Manufacturing has grown. So manufacturing is now about 30, 33, 34% of GDP. Obviously linked uh, dramatically to textiles, but also things like pharmaceuticals. Bangladesh has a has a scaled pharmaceutical industry. In fact, it's almost self-sufficient in its ability to, to manufacture pharmaceuticals for its own population. And there's a manufacturing sector in making fridges and other kitchen equipment. If we look at employment, however, a different picture emerges. Now, the share of employment in industry has grown from 19% in 2011 to nearly 22% now. So keep in mind that industry accounts for 33% of output, but 21%, 22% of employment, suggesting it's a relatively high productivity sector. Farming, agriculture, well, the share has fallen from 47% back in 2011 to 37% now. But keep in mind that it only accounts for 12% of GDP, but employs nearly about 37% of people. So farming is the relatively low productivity sector. And again, the challenge for many of these countries is to is to achieve the productivity, the efficiency gains from commercial farming to uh, to release the population into more productive sectors. So we talked about growth drivers for Bangladesh. I, I always use this country as a really good example of a nation uh, that has developed and built. Can it maintain a scaled competitive advantage in manufacturing and then exporting garments, the textile sector. So in 2022, Bangladesh manufactured one-fifth of the world's exported cotton t-shirts, just under $10 billion of, of revenue there. But it only grew less than 2% of the cotton used. So one of the development challenges there again for Bangladesh, is it tends to be a net importer of cotton and the net exporter of garments. So therefore it's more exposed to increases in the world price of cotton, which is a key import. But the textile sector now employs more than 4 million people. It has over 2,500 factories. And Bangladesh has uh, pursued a, a sort of industrial strategy there to um, uh, things like uh, allowing duty-free or tariff-free import of machinery in export zones and negotiating and sustaining preferential trade agreements with the United States and with the European Union. So, strong growth, rising per capita incomes, the impact of remittances have helped to lift consumer spending and household saving. Savings is about 31-32% of GDP. It's a populous country with rising per capita incomes, and they're getting to a level of per capita income now where millions more households can afford household appliances, uh, things that go with things like motorbikes and appliances and fridges and so on and so forth. So, uh, one of the great Advantages for Bangladesh going forward is they're, they're creating this, the dynamic of stronger internal demand growth. Now, if you can achieve that, you become less dependent, if that makes sense, on exports. So it's getting the balance right between export-driven growth, which requires a lot of imports, and um, domestic growth, consumption, 
investment and government spending. This chart from OEC.world is just obviously brilliant. It just gives you the pattern of trade in goods, not services. But uh, you can see here the dominance of textiles. Textile industries from T-shirts to woolly hats and undergarments is green. So green is textiles. Every different colour is an industry. So uh, purple, for example, is pharmaceuticals. Uh, and you can see that Bangladesh has a, is highly specialised highly dependent, if you like, on manufacturing and exporting garments. Staggeringly high percentage of total exports. Now, the question you might ask is, is it too dependent on the textile sector? Much of which, certainly more than half, is exported to the European Union, a tidy percentage to the United States, and a much smaller percentage to India, uh, to Japan and to, to China. So Bangladesh is a country that is, is growing rapidly, largely on the back of manufacturing of garments, which tend to be fairly low value added. The manufacturing stage isn't in the value chain, isn't really where the profit margin is. It tends to be in the branding and the retail side of garments. So whilst the economy has grown quickly, there are also some significant growth barriers. If it's okay with you, let's just spend a couple of minutes thinking about what some of those limitations are. First of all, as with many countries, Bangladesh has faced the challenge of the recent spike in inflation, uh, in part in particular because it imports energy, it imports cotton, it has a, it imports LNG, gas, okay, liquefied natural gas. So Bangladesh has been exposed to inflationary shocks, and of course high inflation tends to hit lower income families more harder, causing a rise in poverty. They have a high dependence on imports, such as liquefied natural gas, and also a rising level of external debt. They're not the only country where that's the case. Uh, I was reading an OECD report on Bangladesh and it picked out some a couple of really interesting points that they have untapped innovation potential. Only about one and a half percent of firms invest in research and development, which is significantly lower than um, the, the same comparable figure for India, for example. So Bangladesh is not a not a country at the cutting edge of, of dynamic efficiency and innovation. Very, very, very low percentage of firms are investing in R&D. It tends to be you know, assembly, garment manufacturing. There's not a lot of R&D in those kind of sectors. Likewise, their tax to GDP ratio is low. So they're not getting much tax as a share of GDP, partly linked to corruption. But this holds back revenues. You know, you need tax revenues coming in to be able to invest in public services, to, be in, to develop a welfare system, to help stabilise the economy during an economic shock. Exports, as I'm suggesting, perhaps too highly dependent or too highly concentrated in textiles. Indeed, some garment manufacturing is already moving to Africa and to Southeast Asian economies, including Vietnam and, and Cambodia. So if you become too dependent on one industry, it's a little bit like primary product dependency. Manufacturing is footloose. It can move. And it can move quite quickly. Relative to its peers, Bangladesh's labour productivity remains low. One reason for low per capita incomes. Skills mismatches are large, and this obviously holds back living standards. An FDI into Bangladesh uh, is relatively low. It's less than 1% of GDP compared, for example, to 6% in, in Vietnam. I was reading the other day that one third of Vietnamese FDI comes from one company, Samsung. And critically and finally, but in no order of importance, but this is super important. Bangladesh is, of course, one of the most vulnerable countries to, to climate change. Uh, we're looking at the, uh, the the latest data for countries with the highest flood risk in 2023. It's something called the Physical Exposure Index Score. And Bangladesh is top of that list. Indeed, many countries in Southeast Asia are prone to frequent and intense flooding, low average elevations, low-lying countries, high incidence of tropical storms and cyclones, prolonged monsoons, and you know they simply don't have the sophisticated and scaled flood protection infrastructure. So this was a picture, I think, of a flood in Dhaka in, um, in 2020. So keep that in mind, that that is going to be a major challenge, in many ways an opportunity, but a challenge for Bangladesh going forward. Well, I hope you found this useful. I thought I'd choose the country Bangladesh, which is super interesting from a sort of growth and development point of view. Thanks for joining in. If you found the video useful, uh, consider liking and subscribing to the channel, and because we'll, we're we'll going to be adding more country profiles in the weeks leading up to the 2024 exams. Take care, stay safe, stay happy, stay positive and stay curious and see you sometime soon.